Uh, I'm Milinda, so I'm a graduate student at School of Computing, uh, University of Utah. So I'll be talking about uh, uh, solving uh, PDEs in space time. So this uh, work uh, was done as a collaboration between uh, myself and Masado Ishii, uh, Kuma Biswajit, uh, who will be speaking after this talk, and uh, our advisors, uh, Professor Basker and Professor Harisundar. So, okay. So when we talk about uh, uh, large-scale simulations in space-time, so if you want to uh, reduce the overall time to solution, the most uh, approach that people use these days or currently is try try to parallelize the problem in space. So by parallelizing the problem in space, you should be able to reduce the time per time steps. Um, so, but uh, we should ask the question, can we, can we do this uh, uh, arb arbitrarily? So let's say, uh, as you can see, we have uh, some uh, simulation running on 500 cores. And let's say we want to reduce the overall time to solution. So we can increase the number of processors, uh, but uh, you can see the time is reducing and we can reach up to 2000 cores. We can, uh, but when we reduce the when we increase the number of processors after two, uh, 2000 cores, you can see the, the, the time per solution increases. So this is uh, mainly because when we increase the number of cores, the, the, the amount of work assigned for each core is getting smaller and smaller for a fixed problem size. Uh, because of that, uh, you will increase uh, the communication between the processors will increase at some point. And you can see that uh, the communication or the synchronization cost overcome the actually doing the computation. So uh, to uh, the solution for this is, uh, is of course, uh, the, I think the, the topic of this workshop as well, can we do parallelization in time? So we have more parallelism in our problem. So uh, before we, uh, move to uh, uh, parallelization in time. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to give talk about uh, a very brief overview of uh, the, the time stepping methods. So uh, we, uh, so let's say uh, the currently we have uh, most uh, famous approach of the use is the method of line. So you, you have some uh, differential operator defined on space time, you discretize uh, in space, uh, and you you will evolve uh, the solution in time. So you have the solution in these grid points, and using those grid point values, you some kind of uh, using time stepping method, you compute the next time step, and likewise. So, but uh, if you want to be more efficient, you can do adaptivity in space. So you can see. Uh, basically, these grid points are uh, 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 placed uh, not uniformly, so you can uh, reduce the, uh, the the space uh, dx or the space discretization where you need higher resolution, and you can uh, for explicit schemes you can still do the time stepping, but uh, you can do implicit schemes as well. So it based uh, I think uh, this was talked in uh, in the previous talk as well. Instead of uh, you consider a space, discretized space and time separately, you can uh, discretize the space time block. And, uh, but in this approach, we are gonna talk about discretizing space uh, in adaptive space discretization, which is uh, this uh, vertical axis, the space, and the adaptive time discretization. And we are gonna do parallelization in both uh, space and time. So. So in this in this work, we have adaptive space time block, and each each processor will uh, work on some partition partition of uh, space time block, and 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 our mesh or, or the grids are basically based on some uh, called the uh, in two D it's going to be quadrates in three D octrates and in four uh, D it's going to be hexadecatrees. So that's that's going to be our main data structure that we are going to work on. So um, so our main contribution of this work would be we have developed uh, 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 computational algorithms 
uh, for solving PDEs in space-time. And we mainly focus on uh, finite element computations, uh, specifically uh, continuous Kravakin methods. Uh, and, and, and we uh, discuss about parallelizing, uh, and partitioning, and all this stuff in, uh, uh, in, in 4D space-time block. So, um, so this is an example of a, a linear advection diffusion equation. And uh, for visualization or simplicity, we have two space dimensions and uh, the vertical is the time dimension. And you can see uh, when we discretize it, you will get a, a higher resolution adaptively uh, in, in space time. And this, each, each of these, uh, the space time block it's going to get partitioned across uh, across processors, so we're going to have uh, both adaptivity and parallelization in in space time compared to traditional uh, space only parallelization approaches. So let's uh, uh let's okay uh, let's uh, let's uh, uh, look at our. Uh, scalability problem. So this is the strong scaling. So we wanted to know for a fixed problem size, can we keep increasing the number of processors and reduce the, our time to solution? And you can see, as I shown in the before, uh, for three three D space plus time stepping. So you discretize space separately and then use some kind of a time integrator method to evolve the solution in space. Uh, and you can see we, we suffer strong scalability. So basically after 2000 cores, we cannot increase the number of processors and reduce the time. But uh, compared to the, the space-time approach, where we discretize space-time as a whole domain, you can see we can increase this up to 8000 cores. So this is in the space-time approach or also for any problem, depending on the level of parallelization, you can uh, increase a uh, uh, the number of cores after some points, uh, the, 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 the synchronization cost is going to uh, dominate. So, but we, we have in, in increased the level of parallelization. So you can move from 2000 cores to 8000 cores. So I'm going to go over a, a little bit of a mathematical prerequisites. Uh, and I think uh, my colleague Biswajit is going to talk about this more in, in the following talk. So let's say uh, for a uh, simple uh, parabolic PDE in, you know, uh, defined, uh, which is in these equations. And for, for finite element computations, we, we're gonna, uh, instead of using this uh, strong form, we are gonna write uh, this uh, weak form uh, in space time. And, and based on the, uh, uh, differential operators, so the, depending on the different stabil, uh, stabil, stability properties, you might need to add some uh, stabilizing terms. But uh, the end of the day, once you discretize, you will get a linear system. So you approximate uh, this, uh, the continuous problem as uh, this uh, linear system, and then you apply the correct boundary conditions and get the solution. Uh, basically, to get the solution, you need to solve this linear system. So, so this is the main overview of the, 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 the numerical size. But I'm, in this talk, like I mentioned, I'm going to focus on the computational considerations. OK. So we know that um, the, in 4D parallel, it's, you can discretize PDs in weak form in uh, 4D space time. But uh, how can we compute this uh, in efficiently in scalable fashion? So. Uh, uh, when we talking about how parallelizing the problem, the partitioning becomes uh, very important because the, depending on how you partition your grid, the load imbalance, the communication costs, everything determi uh, determined by how you partition the mesh. And we need to do mesh generation. We need to be able to uh, generate 4D grids efficiently, especially when if you want to do frequent remeshing grid. For some reason, your uh, space-time domain changes or something in the space-time domain changes, you need frequent remeshing, then the, the efficiency of the mesh generation becomes extremely important. And uh, we also need to focus on about the scalability. So 
if you want to do large scale parallel computations, uh, we should be able to scale into larger number of cores. And uh, maybe if you are doing uh, 4D simulations, the adaptivity becomes very important to reduce the number of uh, unknowns on the, on the 4D domain. So I'm going to address uh, mainly these topics uh, for 4D uh, space-time discretizations. So in this, uh, in this work, we are going to talk about matrix tree. So like I said, uh, uh, in the variational form, you will get a point discretization, you will get a linear system, but uh, we, are, we are not uh, going to compute these matrices explicitly, compute them and store them. We are going to use matrix free approaches because uh, it scales better and storing these 4D matrices might be very expensive, the storage cost. And we are going to talk about mesh free approach. So in the mesh, uh, in the sense mesh free approach, I mean that we don't use the, the, the element wise uh, neighborhood data structures. Uh, instead of, because uh, like I said, computing the 4D mesh data structures is again become a high, high storage cost. So we want to try to avoid this, uh, these things. Okay, so what, what would be the, our, our algorithm would look like? So mainly our algorithm is based on something called the tree sort, uh, which is uh, for, and we, we, we do this mesh generation and partitioning in, uh, in parallel. Uh, so, so let's, we have main three steps to compute this computation. So we need to be able to generate uh, an adaptive mesh, and then we should be able to define uh, vectors on this mesh. I will uh, like a grid point, so the number unknowns. And then we should be able to compute this matrix vector product. Uh, so we can use some iterative solving technique uh, to solve uh, for the solution. So uh, let's uh, talk about how we perform uh, uh, first focus on the this adaptive mesh generation. So basically we assume that we have uh, our, this is our computational domain and we have set of grid points. Now we would like to generate a adaptive grid uh, on these points. Let's say each element should contain uh, only one point, one of these points. So what we're gonna do is we will do an integer representation of these points. So we can look at these uh, bits of each point. So we are gonna do this, look at the most significant digit of this point and, uh, okay. Oops. Okay, so we, we're gonna look at the most significant digit which is highlighted and we based by looking at this digit, we can group these points into each, each of these four element. So after that, the tree sort is basically uh, use some space filling curve ordering. So uh, uh, this curve ordering becomes uh, important when we are partitioning the mesh. So basically a space filling curve is a, a, a 1D curve which runs on a higher dimensional space and it gives uh, some kind of an ordering operator in this higher dimensional space. So we, we, we loop over the points, bucket the points by looking at the most significant digit and we reorder them based on the space filling curve. And then we, we're gonna look at the next most significant digit and then we can recurse on the each bucket since it has more than one point. And, uh, and then after that, we again reorder them uh, using uh, the space filling curve. So when we do this, Let's say now we want, now we have, I think uh, 16 elements. So let's say we have four processors, we can partition this, this part. The based, uh, partition based on how the partition becomes is basically using the space filling curve, you, the partitioning problem becomes a 1D problem. You just cut the curve based on the, the weight of the curve, the length. The length we can define is the number of elements we encounter when we traverse along this curve and uh, we can partition the curve in for here, if we can partition it like this, so the partitions become this one. So we can do this uh, recursively again and again for looking at each, the next most significant digit 
reorder in them uh, using the space filling curve. And when, the, when it becomes a load imbalance, we can partition uh, by, re, by do a repartition by looking at the space filling curve. That's what the tree sort does. So we keep going and until we, we get the adaptive mesh. So now we have an adaptive grid which capture the, which uh, agree with our refinement criteria. So we, we, we had the refinement criteria, each element should contain at most one point. So uh, how we can, how we can uh, define a vector. So basically we want to have this kind of a shared node representation or basically independent degrees of freedom. So the overview idea is we start with the octant uh, local or you can consider them, this is uh, the node placement if you do uh, DG computations. Um, but uh, we call them, let's call them octant nodal, uh, octant local representation. So each octant, uh, this each element has its own set of nodes. So the number of nodes that we place for an element will depend on the element order of the computation. And then what we're going to do is we're going to do a top-down pass. So we look at the look at these uh, these regions, and we and first we resolve the, uh, the the duplicate nodes in these regions, and we request. So in how let's uh, look at an example. So we have this uh, uh, the uh, we this is this is what we want to achieve. This is the independent degrees of freedom. So we start with uh, this octant uh, local in, uh, nodal placement. And we look at first, we look at uh, the root level, this, the big, the biggest cube uh, that we can have. And we first uh, do resolve the conflict. So as you can see, you have two nodes that is shared by the same element and you resolve these node conflicts. So then after that, you will get uh, the no, there's uh, no duplicate nodes um, the, in, 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 in the root level. So then we move uh, to the next level, which is in this, this region. And we again, look at the nodal uh, computer, the nodal conflicts, and we resolve the no nodal conflicts. And we, we gonna go to the next level, which is this one, and this one, and you can see, we don't need to recurse on this bucket because uh, there's no elements in that bucket. So we had we have already reached the leaf leaf node of uh, this 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 part of the the mesh. So we resolve the conflicts uh, across these these axes, and and then after that, we will end up within the octant uh, interior nodes the element interior nodes there, you don't have to resolve any conflict with those nodes because um, they, are gonna, they are not gonna be shared across elements. So those nodes are gonna be there. Just we, we only have to resolve conflicts in this, the octant shared boundaries. So after that, now we can define, we have the independent degrees of freedom and we can define like vectors in the memory and you can see each each entry of the vector uh, vector is going to ma get mapped to the grid point in the mesh. Okay, so I think uh, we have completed uh, step one and step two. So now let's see how we are going to do uh, matrix-free finite element computations uh, in this mesh. So um, for the matrix-free finite uh, finite element computation is already in. Uh, we do computations by looping over each element. We visit each element, do some elemental computation, and we accumulate. If it is matrix-based, we accumulate it to a global matrix. But if it is a matrix-free, we accumulate the ma elemental matrix vector multiplication to the global vector, which is presented here. So what we're going to start with right now, we the in, the, the the mesh free. We, like I said, we don't use the elemental uh, to nodal data structures. So we don't know for a given element, what would be its nodal values. What we're gonna do is instead of that, we are gonna do some traversals. So we're gonna do a top-down traversal 
So basically in the top-down traversal, we are gonna duplicate the nodes that is gonna get shared across the elements. For example, in this case, this node will get duplicated across uh, this node, this element, this ele in these four elements because it's gonna get shared by four elements. And we do this and we recurse until we hit the leaf node. And, and, uh, and we again duplicate and and again, in the, this level, the nodes are going to get duplicated, which is uh, in the blue, and uh, and 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 the yellow nodes, which are going to get interpolated from the the, the this uh, parent edge. So once we once we reach uh, the element local or the, the the leaf nodes, we for each element should have its uh, the elemental nodal values, and we can do the elemental uh, matrix vector multiplication, and then we are going to accumulate, which is basically a bottom-up pass uh, to the to the this this global vector. So, in order to summarize, so basically, in the matrix is uh, done by tree traversal. So we start with the root, and we we recurse uh, or the top down. We go in the right direction like this. And we again do a top down because we have uh, so more elements in these buckets that we need to reach the leaf. After we hit the leaf, uh, we do some elemental computations and we do a bottom up, a bottom up pass from right to left to reach the, the independent degrees of freedom. So this is basically how we do the, the elemental matrix. So let's uh, evaluate our, our, our performance. So, so this is uh, some example for linear linear diff uh, diffusion equations uh, for like uh, uh, the space-time block and uh, linear advection, and we have some uh, non-linear problem as well. But it's just that uh, you have adaptivity and parallelization in both space time. Okay, let's uh, let's talk about uh, the the mesh generation, the performance of the mesh generation. So, so the we can we, we the to generate the mesh, we need the tree sort, which is basically partitioning, uh, which require when we want to partition the grid points across the processors. Tree construction is where basically you might get an incomplete tree where you the, uh, the, the leaf node might be missing. So you basically detect this missing uh, leaf nodes and add this leaf node. And uh, we use something called the two to one balancing, which uh, ensures that for each given uh, uh, not in the tree, it's neighboring neighboring elements. Uh, neighboring elements can differ only by one level. So for, for a given element E, its neighboring element can either be one level coarser or one level finer. So this is called two to one balancing. And uh, the unique node is basically what I explained as uh, computing the, the, node, the independent nodes. And the, the, the communication map is basically for each processor, it, we, 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 we will mark the nodes that that processor will need to send to other processors to, so that they can compute the, 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 the computations, the elements that shared between processor boundaries. So you can see uh, that the tree sort, tree construction is, and the tree balancing is, is, uh, is not very uh, expensive, but the computation of these unique nodes and the communication map and you can see we show this is for the weak scalability across 6,000 uh, cores and uh, for linear and quadratic uh, element basis functions. And um, these are the, uh, the strong scaling results uh, for, and we show the same exact, um, uh, uh, the, 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 the runtime uh, uh, decomposition uh, for the mesh generation. The, for the strong scaling across uh, 3,000 cores, I think these experiments were conducted in uh, in Stampede. And uh, and let's say how the the efficiency of the performing a matrix vector multiplication. So you can see you do a top down approach. Like I said, to do a matrix, we need to top down and we hit the leaf node. When we hit the leaf node, we do leaf computations and do a bottom up. And of course, we need to have the communication uh, between the processors. So what we do is we start the communication. We can do the top-down approach and maybe wait for the elements that needs to be communicated. 
and do the leaf metric and the, 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 the do the bottom up. So and and there are some there are going to be some duplication of the nodes, which is uh, because when we top down, we have to duplicate some nodes. So for that, we need to do some memory allocations. And these are the matrix vector multiplication uh, for uh, the, the, the strong scaling across 6,000 pros. And uh, we show, I think we, I have shown this plot. Uh, we show that uh, we can scale strong scaling wise. The space time discretization give you better uh, scalability. And we have scalability of course, uh, uh, 16,000 cores uh, in, in, in Stampede. And, uh, and this is the weak, uh, uh, the, 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 and you can see the, this is the ideal, ideal uh, strong scaling. And we can see the, the 40, 40 space time discretization uh, tends to be more ideally scaling compared to uh, three plus one discretization. Uh, with that, I think I would uh, like to acknowledge uh, the research funding agencies the National Science Foundation and uh, DOE, I think, uh, and uh, the Exceed, uh, 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 which is basically the support for giving us compute time in the Stampede 2 supercomputer. Um, and uh, I would like to point out the, 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 the all these uh, discussed algorithms are, are implemented is in our framework name is uh, Dandro KT, uh, which is an open source code and uh, and you can go to the repository and you can uh, you can try to run download and run band of KT. and if you have any interesting problems that you'd like to explore uh, the space time adaptivity and space parallel 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 space time adaptivity and would like to co collaborate uh, you can you can uh, contact our research group uh, with that i would like to conclude the presentation uh, uh, thank you for your time